Okay, good morning. Um, we are holed up here inside. Here's Yodi. Just got done trying to eat everything. Next up is a chew toy for her. Um, but now we're sleeping quietly, which is a good time. I want to bring you another book from my bookshelf and read a little bit of it. So the book is Annapurna, um, all, and it says A Woman's Place. So this is the dramatic story of the first American ascent of one of the world's highest peaks. So Annapurna is a mountain. Um, we can see from the map. Oh, this is a really cool copy too. I just bought this off online, like cheap books or something, but it's signed by Arlene Bloom, who is the author. Um, and I read one of her other books, her biography of her life, and she's an incredible woman. She has her doctorate in biochemistry, and she studied flame retardants that cause cancer in, uh, in babies. So they put them in cribs, and they used to put it in all sorts of things, and she discovered that it causes cancer, and it actually is not very good. Um, but if, if you were to burn with this flame retardant on, it would, like, burn to you, too. So it was, like, a whole mess of it not being good. And she, um, and then she took an activist focus and she actually went out and lobbied for this to not ever be used again, which was true. And then later in life, she had a child and took her for the first, like, two years of her life hiking in the Alps. So that was pretty cool. I can't even imagine really, I mean, me and Coyote have been chilling at home because that's what we can handle. So and Coyote's a little fur baby. I can't imagine taking a real baby in the mountains. So pretty inspiring woman and she put together a team of 10 women to um, hike Annapurna and they thought it could not be done um, a lot of people were doubting their mission but it was really cool because this story accounts how a whole group of people came together to make this mission possible so I want you to think as we're reading through this what have you have you been part of a team that helped you accomplish something bigger than you ever thought possible just by yourself. Um, so that's your first challenge, your first question. The other thing I wanna do as we read through this is I want to highlight some of the women that actually went on the expedition because each one is a character and each one has a little something to say on what it means to be a woman. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna read some expert excerpts from the book. Here we go. Um, okay, and this is just in the intro, but she says, Similarly, I am often drawn into debates about whether women or men have more endurance or some physical or psychological edge in climbing. I don't believe that such comparisons are of any value. Individual differences are more important than sexual ones, and motivation counts most of all. Women do have the strength and endurance to climb the house, highest mountains, just as men do, and both men and women should have the chance. The American Women's Himalayan Expedition gave 10 women that chance to face the challenge and earn the rewards. Maurice Herzog expresses this well in his account of the first ascent of Annapurna. In attempting to do the hardest tasks, all our resources are called upon, and the power and greatness of mankind, she put an emphasis on kind, are defined. So... Another interesting part that she brings up in the intro is that the word Annapurna actually means woman, the goddess rich in sustenance, and sustenance being like the thing you're made of, the element, like the, the, the beef, if you're vegan, the like uh, THP <laughs> or T, TVP, textured vegetable protein. Okay, anyway, so um, it's also called the Harvest Goddess. So she is reflecting on which would you rather, the Goddess of Rich Sustenance or the Harvest Goddess? Because the Harvest Goddess maybe alludes to taking, taking some souls, which Annapurna has been known to do. So this is a pretty dangerous um, thing that they're about to attempt. All right. So... Um, we're gonna just jump in. Here's a map. I love looking at the maps. The topography. There it is. 
Annapurna in this mass of mountainous upheavals in the ground. This is in India. Um, Annapurna is somewhere around here. I think we can't quite see that. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, um, there it comes. So this is Nepal, sorry, but it's north of India. You can see that here. All right, uh, it's in the Dulagiri region of North Nepal Himalaya. The okay, so so I'm going to start reading about the team members. Um, our expedition would give ten women the chance to attempt one of the world's highest and most challenging peak, as well as the experience necessary to plan future Himalayan climbs. If we succeeded, we would be the first Americans to climb Annapurna, and the first American women to reach 8,000 meters, or 26,200 feet. Our preparations for the climb had begun to weld the team members, 13 very different individuals, into a strong and cohesive unit. As I looked around at the other women on the plane, inheritors of the traditions of Alexandra David Neal and Annie S. Peck, I felt confident that whether or not we reached the top of the mountain, we were going to make a good effort and enjoy ourselves in the process. Vera Watson was the proper lady of the group, outwardly feminine, even fluttery. Inside, she was strong, confident, and fearless. A complex woman with a romantic spirit and a determined will. A computer scientist and the first woman ever to make a solo ascent of Aconcagua in Argentina, the tallest mountain in the Western Hemisphere. She was now at 46, realizing a long-standing ambition to climb in the high Himalaya. Vera looked slim and elegant in her beige traveling suit and Dior glasses, but typically she was discontented with herself. I shouldn't be eating these. I'm so fat, she said as she offered me her airplane almonds. So I, the next person, Irene Miller, was already writing a letter to her family. A physicist at IBM, she was the only mother on the expedition with children still at home. She had confided to me that she was extremely concerned about the dangers of Annapurna, not only the risk to herself, but the potential loss to her children. Irene was very close to her two daughters, and indeed, she, though she was 42, she could have been mistaken for her elder daughter, Carolyn. Irene had taken part in several expeditions since the birth of her daughters, though most of her significant climbing including first ascents in Peru and in Tetons, had been done more than 16 years earlier. So here's a picture of, you can see Irene and Vera. Okay. Vera, Irene, and I, who were close friends and lived near each other in the San Francisco Bay Area, and share much of the responsibility for the overall organization of the expedition. Our first task had been to choose a qualified team. Back in 1973, when Wanda Rutkiewicz and British climber Alison Chadwick Onizinkiewicz and I were trying to organize a 1975 Polish-American women expedition to Annapurna, I had invited Irene and two other women climbers, Piero Kremar and Joan Fieri, from among the very few I knew at the time. The permit from the Nepalese government to climb the mountain had not come through for 1975, so we all temporarily turned our attention elsewhere. When Vera, Irene, and I began in early 1977 to plan for the current expedition, Piero, Joan, and Allison were obvious choices for the team. Now, as we flew westward from the twilight, Joan and Allison were already in Nepal making arrangements for local food and supplies. Coincidentally, Wanda was there too, as a member of an international expedition that would be climbing Mount Everest while we were on Annapurna. Piero Kramar, sitting in the seat behind me, was writing in her diary. Piero, 40, an ophthalmologist from Seattle, was our expedition doctor. Glancing at her diary, I could not make out any familiar words. What's that you're writing? I asked. I'm practicing my... Hungarian, she answered. That's pretty cool. I don't even know what Hungarian looks like. 
I guess I wouldn't be able to use experts, excerpts from the expedition book. I was disappointed. A diary is by nature a private document. A diary in Hungarian, doubly so. This was characteristic of Pyrrho, who guarded her privacy to the point of seemingly emotion, seeming emotionally detached. She stayed aloof from squabbles, was slow to make judgments, and was inclined to keep to herself. Pyrrho had done most of her climbing with only one or two friends, often Joan Fury, in the Washington Cascades. She had doubts about being away from home so long, and about climbing with such a large group. Yet, here she was, on an expedition that would take three months and require close cooperation among dozens of people. So here's Pyrrho. Um, can you identify with any of those traits, keeping privacy, or are you on the opposite end of the spectrum, maybe not caring what people think? The rest of the team had heard about the expedition through Climber's Grapevine and the general press. When the Nepalese finally gave us our permit to attempt Annapurna in the fall of 1978, our plans were very well publicized. Hundreds of women asked to join us, ranging from some of the world's most technical best climbers to two of Berkeley's <laughs> to two Berkeley masseuses who wanted to come along to massage our tired muscles. Finding climbers with the right mental and physical qualifications was extremely important. The first American women Himalayan expedition naturally would seem a most exciting and desirable venture. But for many climbers, the initial grandeur, glamour of expeditionary climbing soon fades and the actual experience, altitude, grinding hard work, damp, cold, tedium, bureaucratic hassles, and the possibility of illness or injury can be wearisome, disappointing, even devastating. During the long, severe storms frequently encountered in the Himalaya, climbers sometimes become apathetic and quit eating and drinking, which quickly leads to debilitation. The determination needed to keep melting snow for water and cooking can ultimately be more valuable than the skill to climb steep snow for mountain. Keep, keep melting snow for water, and cooking can ultimately be more valuable than the skill to climb steep ice. Mental toughness and physical endurance, rather than muscular strength, are the essential qualities of successful high-altitude climbers. Just as important is the ability to enjoy this peculiar, peculiar form of recreation despite its inevitable hardships. Prior high altitude climbing experience was also desirable, for there exists in some people an altitude barrier, above which they cannot stay healthy. The reasons for this phenomenon are not well understood yet. Such a problem plagued the women who led the 1970s all-women McKinley climb that's up in Alaska. Up to 14,000 feet she could climb the most severe slopes carrying heavy loads, but beyond that elevation, she was relatively weak and suffered intensely from the altitude. For Annapurna, we tried to invite women who had successfully climbed above 20,000 feet before. In most cases, however, this did not mean Himalayan experience. Few women had that opportunity. Applicants with the desired credentials and enthusiasm were invited to participate in one of our many practice climbs in the High Sierra. After we had been climbing together, both of the prospective members of the rest of the team had a better sense of whether or not she belonged on the expedition. The selective process worked well, and whether or not she belonged, even, and even women who ultimately did not join the team made new friends and found climbing partners. There were no seriously hurt feelings or bruised egos. The other team members we chose were Margie Rushmore, Rushmore and Elizabeth Klobushti Maylinder, who would meet us in Nepal, and Vera um, Komarkova and Annie Whitehouse, who were among the group on the plane. Now just Vera Kormakova was dozing next to Irene. We call her Vera Kay and Vera Watson became Vera W. She and Irene became good friends while climbing together in the Brooks Range of Alaska, and Irene had persuaded me to visit Vera Kay on the expedition. Together they had begged, borrowed, and bought our 3,000 pounds of equipment, from hardware to helmets, sleeping bags to socks, and gloves to garbage bags. In her 40, 
35 years, Vera Kay had immigrated from native Czechoslovakia to the United States, spent an entire year walking across Europe and North America to the Mexico City Olympics, obtained a PhD from the University of Colorado, studying Arctic and high altitude plant ecology, and made some of the hardest wall climbs ever done by a woman, including an epic 20 day ascent of a vertical, wind blasted face of Mount Dickey in Alaska. Irene had described Vera Kay to me as a real powerhouse, strong and energetic. Others who had climbed with her had put off by her overriding individualism. I found her the most enigmatic character of the group. I didn't know whether I would eventually rejoin or regret that I didn't know whether I would eventually rejoice or regret that we had invited her, but I wondered why she never took off her tinted glasses. <laughs> this is a picture of her. What do you think? Why do you think she never took off her tinted glasses? Maybe she's wanting to keep her character and not let people get close. Sometimes that can be like, I'm individual, like, don't, don't get near me, right? Like, I'm keeping my boundaries. Okay. Annie Whitehouse, sitting next to me was smiling her wonderful smile and working busily on her diary, drawing cartoons, I noticed. Ordinarily, Annie would never have been invited to the Himalaya. She was only 21, generally considered too young, and she was the wrong sex. But this sturdy young woman had determination, endurance, a tolerant disposition, and a fine sense of humor. We believed she would make a first-class expedition climber. So here is a picture. This is great. This is a picture of Annie. 21. What could having a good sense of humor do to an expedition like this? Such a serious undertaking. For most of the women involved, all serious climbers, a Himalayan expedition was a long cherished but unlikely dream. Many members, particularly the older ones, felt that this trip was probably their only chance to climb in the high Himalaya. Hero, Irene, and Vera W. were in their 40s, and Joan Fury would celebrate her 50th birthday on the mountain. Occasionally, Ira, Irene, and Vera W. would protest half-seriously that they were too old for a Himalayan climbing. The conventional wisdom is that expedition climbers are at their prime in their 30s. But this does not allow for the experience, tolerance, and steadiness that often comes with age and which more than compensate for a small decrease in physical strength. Christy Tews, our base camp manager, a solid 38-year-old woman from the Midwest, possessed these qualities but lacked the mountaineering to be a climbing member of the team. She had worked as hard as anyone to get this far, and at the moment she was doing a good business selling expedition t-shirts to the other passengers on the plane. The profits from the remarkable t-shirts had helped make the expedition possible. This is great. She's talking about how they came up with her their t-shirts. Um, and I, I'm going to read. I'm going to keep reading. Mm -hmm. When we received our permit, we had no idea how we were going to raise the $38,000 we would need for the climb. None of us had extensive private resources or even secretaries to help with the endless details of fundraising. But we did have something much more important. Numerous supporters who believed in what we were doing and offered their skills and their time. Because the climbers themselves were too busy with the preparations, such as buying and organizing food and gear, friends and volunteers undertook the enormous task of raising money. My house in Berkeley was usually overflowing with volunteers and enthusiasm, the phone ringing constantly, the air, of electric, the air electric with excitement. Fundraising ideas varied. Balls, banquets, bumpers, stickers, bay cruises, posters, placards, parties, signet rings, celebrity cocktail parties, races, tennis tournaments, and treks were all proposed at various times. A suggestion that we design and sell an expedition t-shirt seemed promising. At one hilarious meeting, we looked at about 20 possible designs, sketches of Annapurna, of a woman climbing with her hair sweeping into the shape of a mountain, of climbing equipment, climbers on top mountains, mountains on top of climbers, 
Finally, at the bottom of the pile, I came to the most delightful, perfect design imaginable. I hugged it to my chest and burst with laughter. This was it. I passed the stack of designs to Irene, and when she came to the last one, she began to laugh. The reaction around the entire circle of climbers and volunteers was the same, and decision was unanimous. The design was a distinctive outline of the mountain with a daring slogan, a woman's place is on top, Annapurna. <laughs> Originally, we ordered several dozen shirts to sell our friends, but the demand for the shirts soon became overwhelming and left us completely disorganized. Yeah, have you ever done something and been completely over your head in it? Sounds like this. Hundreds of t-shirts were stacked all over my house, and I dealt with a myriad, bewildering inquiries from people wanting different colors or styles. I'm sorry, it doesn't come in chartreuse, quinoa, quinoa, quinoa jumpsuit, while the snows of Annapurna seem to recede further and further. So they're doing all those preparations, but this task at hand seems further and further away. Okay, so they organized some other... Um, some other expeditions. They're selling their shirts. And I want to, just to wrap this up, talk about two of their camera people. Um, our two women film crew recorded the scene. Okay, so, yeah. Diana Taylor, camera, and Marie Ashton, sound, were young filmmakers with impressive experience and credentials. We didn't know until the last minute if we would be able to afford to make our own film crew and Diana and Marie had dropped their own, their other commitments on short notice to join us. In climbing lessons and condition, conditioning with heavy packs in the Berkeley Hill, to finding cameras and sound equipment that would work well at low temperatures. So lots of things to think about here. The team had been divided about what sort of film would be best. Some favored the traditional approach, focusing on precipitous slopes and wind-blown summits. Others of us believed that a unique film would be made showing how we would, as women, face some of the hardest physical and mental challenges. We felt that such a film would be best made by a two-woman crew who would unobtrusively record our dealings with the mountains and with each other. Commercial television networks had wanted to send large film crews of men that would climb with us and film us on the sleep steepest slopes. When we decided to hire two women without climbing experience, one network officer told us that this approach was unlikely to yield anything better than home movies and that we should not bring the film to show them afterwards. He was wrong. Diana and Marie climbed above Camp 2 at 19,000 feet to shoot superb high mountain footage and their excellent hour-long documentary about the Annapurna climb was aired on ABC TV. Oh, okay, so... So that kind of um, sums up their team here. And they start their expedition. And I suppose if you want to learn more, you could watch the documentary or you could buy this book. So I want to know from you, one, do you want to climb a mountain now? Do you think the preparation sounds really exciting? Um, how about being on a team of women all trying to do something that is radical and pushing the limits of what we know we can do as humans. Um, so this happened in, 1970, in the 1970s. Um, do you have any desires to travel to faraway lands like Nepal? Uh, what challenges do you think will come up for these women? And how do you think they'll overcome them? And then maybe respond, which one of these characters seems to be um, more, most likely, or more like you. Um, I'm excited to see what you think about this book. I really enjoyed reading part of this to you. Uh, let me know if you would like more parts of this to be read. That would be cool. Otherwise, have a fantastic day. Look forward to hearing your thoughts. And yeah, have fun. Think hard. Be safe.